So I'm going to read from this uh, strange, profane novel that I uh, cobbled together out of verse and prose. Uh, yeah, a third of it's in verse, the rest of it is in kind of a mishmash of prose and poetry. And it's about three young men who grew up in a nameless town, very similar in fact to my hometown, Queanbeyan, Struggle Town, New South Wales. And I think I've got someone from Queanbeyan, don't I? Yeah! That's the way, the 2620 representing. Um, <laughs> And so it's about three young men uh, who are of different ethnic backgrounds, feeling very powerless in Australia. Uh, one is Solomon, a Samoan Australian guy who's had a horrendous injury, a horrendous injury in basketball, just trying to find redemption in his life. His younger brother, Jimmy, uh, whose ethnic origins are much more hazy, who ends up doing some uh, very diabolical things in the book. And their, and their mate, Alex, who's a Macedonian Australian guy who drifts in and out of the uh, criminal world. So I'm going to read from the first chapter, and uh, let me just give a language warning um, for those of you with sensitive, tender, innocent ears. Uh, there is a word I'm going to say that is incredibly offensive in America, um, and in Australia too, kind of, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's the, uh, the, the infamous C word, uh, which um, amongst some young men in Australia has become kind of, you can use it as a term of endearment, so it's not always... <laughs> An insult. Uh, so you can call someone a, a smart cunt or a funny cunt or whatever. Um, and you are all sick cunts, you know? So, uh, yeah. I can tell everyone's already feeling a bit uneasy. But anyway, <laughs> deal with it. This has always been a land of fire. Once a year, the ancients would go into the mountains in search of bogong moths. They carried burning branches and thrust them into rents in the rock, stunning the congregated moths, then catching them in fibrous nets or kangaroo skin. The moths were roasted on fine embers and the ancients feasted, vomiting for the first few days, but then growing accustomed to the rich, fatty food. The ancients would return from the mountains with glossy skin, glistening like shadow. Afterwards, fires would burn on the mountains for days. Chapter 1. <clears throat> Where are these cunts? <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I kind of like the idea. It was like, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. You know, call me Ishmael. Oh, mum will say, Where are these cunts? Yeah. <laughs> ah, it's too hot, bro. Too fucking long without rain. Two by two, they troop in. The madness of summer in the brain. In the dying light, the crowd looked like hundreds of bobbling balloons waiting to be unfastened, sweating tinnies and foreheads, sad cunts and sorrow drowners, the lot of them. A stand up, six foot two and shining, yawn, twist side to side of my hinges and survey the crowd. Shit, it's not like the boys to be late, especially on a day like today, because it's summer, the deeper season, throbbing with danger and promise, Every scallywag, seed thief and skate park wrapped up in a white hot skin. And here come the dogs, strange, smiling creatures, lean flanked and ready to race. Do you guys have racing dogs here, racing greyhounds? Okay, in Australia it's more like, you know, the middle classes will go and watch the horse racing, but the working man's one is to watch the dogs race. <laughs> strange, smiling creatures, lean flanked and ready to race. An old bloke turns around and grins with opalized eyes. Nothing like the old dish lickers, eh? I smile, flick a fly from my knuckle. Yeah, fucking oath, brother. The dog's barks detonate across the track. The trainers are gruff people, but now they coo to the hounds, straightening their racing silks, crouching to check and bend their ankles. One says a prayer and kisses his dog on its narrow head. A dry wind scythes across the stands and I reach up to keep my hat on. Bushfire weather, eh? The old timer is right. This town is a powder keg, a perfect altar for a bushfire, the sole god of a combustible summer. But fuck it, I'm crisp tea fresh, black on black, snap back, toothbrush on sneaker, throwback fresh. But fuck me dead. The joints and muscles ache nowadays, sign of the times, eh? I look at the old timer and immediately touch the muscles under my shirt, just to make sure. I grin, Solomon Amosa, you vain, vain bastard. 
So his half-brother Jimmy turns up, Alex turns up, they proceed to get in a very petty argument about who their favourite Australian rapper is. It's a type of argument going on amongst young hip-hop heads all around Australia. You might not know, but we've got a very rich hip-hop uh, scene over there. And, um, you know, they've been drinking a few tinnies, a few cans, but uh, being at the Greyhound races, they need a little something extra to rev things up. I wipe the top of the cistern and bring up my hand. There's white powder on the palm. I love doing that. It's almost like I've busted someone in the act. Alex takes out a marker and writes his tag on the cubicle wall with a flourish. J-A-K-E-L. Meanwhile, Jimmy racks up three lines with a seasoned hand in his key card. My brother Jimmy, who could never even handle his beer back in the day. Alex does a line and blinks. Dear oh fucking me! This is good shit, bro! Aryan white. See, now race is coming into it. No. I, roll, I roll up the drawn-on five-buck note and hoover a line. The cocaine hits immediately. That cold zoom in the guts. A perfectly timed tackle. I backflip into a glacial crevasse. The track smoulders. Thick lights shine down, holding within them insects and motes of dust. The dog's feet articulate delicately on the soil of the holding pen. In part, dieted on honey, vegetable oil and eggs, their coats glow. There are tinny announcements over the loudspeakers now. The trainers are hand-slipping the dogs, one hand on the collar, the other arm hooked at the base of their undercarriages, shuffling them forward into the traps. Like everyone else, we riffle and check our bets. In the stands, we can hear the dogs' high-pitched whimpers and yelps as they scrape in the traps, and we begin to cheer. Bang goes the gun, zoom goes the artificial rabbit, off go the hounds like water out of sluice. They are a rumbling mass at first, but as they round the corner they separate into surreal, spearheaded things that lope and arch through the air, feet, dust, sound. The crowd rises and we do too, ten feet tall and charged with powder, seeing the race in jittering frames, and here comes our favourite racer, Mercury Fire, a grey streak of ribs, sinew-lashed muscle, light. Right down the straight he looks like a young dog again, propelled by furious, otherworldly energy. He's neck and neck for the lead with two black hounds loping forward, urging him a screaming, screaming, Come on, boy, come on! And Mercury Fire is straining onwards, every muscle working for the one goal, courage and conviction in the blood, launching over the track for the very last time. He comes in third, and I realise that I've been holding my breath for the entire race. Thank you. I'm going to do two more small sections. I wanted to write about hip-hop culture in this book. Uh, hip-hop culture in Australia hadn't really been written about in fiction before. You know, there have been some great books about Melbourne graffiti and everything like that. But having been an MC for many years, there were certain things that I'd seen, like a, a freestyle cipher or kind of uh, graffiti missions and things like that, that I felt like uh, were very dramatic and could have played a good part in fiction. So I wanted to write about that. And this is uh, when the young fellas... Well, they're not that young. They're in their late 20s. Uh, but, you know, I, I want to define that as young because I'm 32 now, so, you know, I want to be <laughs> close to youth. And, uh, and they're at a Pharaoh Monch concert, so well-known New York MC who has come to Australia many times, uh, and so I felt like he should be immortalised for that, for showing us the love of coming across the other side of the world. The moment of epiphany about hip-hop had come at age 12. A cassette tape passed from paw to paw, backpack to backpack, had ended up in Jimmy's pencil case. On each side of the tape, a name written in whiteout, Public Enemy, Wu-Tang Clan. Jimmy, Alex and Solomon had gathered around an old cassette player. And some of you might remember what those are. A crackle and then suddenly a maelstrom of noise from the tinny speakers. It was street, eloquent and masculine. Tough as smoke and Joe Frazier, the hell raiser, raising hell with the flavour. It was love at first listen. Hip-hop seemed like a ready-made culture for the fatherless, those born of fracture, family, culture. 
They all loved listening to raps, of course, but Alex leaned more towards graffiti, Solomon b-boying, and Jimmy, production and DJing. Jimmy, especially, adhered to the idea of hip-hop culture religiously. If he could have prayed at an altar of hip-hop, shit, he would have. There was a taut string that yanked back and forth, back and forth between the individual and community, with each person's style and flourish encouraged, the way someone wrote a beat or moved their hands when they rapped, but adherence to the tribe was paramount, and no school could teach it. You learned it for yourself. You learned it from your brothers and your sisters. One rhyme turned into a 16-bar verse that turned into a whole song, then maybe even an album or a critically acclaimed book that could be pressed and performed live in front of your peers. A simple top rock turned into a whole routine to be paraded in front of other b-boys in the arena of battle. Tags led to throw-ups, which led to full-color burners, which archaeologists would one day pore over, like the chrysography of illuminated religious texts on vellum. Pharaoh Monch is on stage now, already drenched in sweat, his tea bunched up around the biceps, tats visible, lead and mic and human, creating an amplified creature all new, a philosopher's stone for an alchemy where every single molecule in the room came to a pristine understanding, something sublime in spirit and body, the flow, the rupture, the rapture, something conjured for a brave and hopeless few. So when the world-ending horns of Simon Says come on, there is fucking pandemonium. A super quick one. This is about Australia. It's about the bushfires that devastate our landscape every year. Uh, I think you call them forest fires. They happen in California all the time. A monstrous deranged chaos prevails. A cardiogram of the nation is written into the rumbling flames. From the Air Peninsula to Gippsland to the Blue Mountains, horizons shimmer and bend. The needle on the fire danger sign points to catastrophic and code red. Life and death are both staunch in their will to survive. The large and small clash against one another. Wind, land, water, fire and man, embroiled in a tussle with no resolution except that it must happen again. There is sobbing and screaming, sirens, black clouds, cauliflower, rubber is scribbled on asphalt as trucks swerve through the firewall. Animals seek refuge on highways, mammals and reptiles next to each other, stunned by fear, arranged as if by design on tar so hot a man's foot can sink in it. Power generators break down and dams are filled with a turbid mixture of ash and silt. In two days alone, a fire truck is burned to its spine. Ten people lose their lives and hundreds of houses are destroyed. There are rumours of looting and abandoned cars show their ribs to the sky. After the fire has moved on, people pick through the carnage of their houses like rag and bone men, with tears streaking clear lines down their masks of soot. A woman clutches a photo album to her chest while her husband sifts through bricks and broken pottery and misshapen blobs that were once glass bottles. He stoops, picks up a diamond ring and holds it to the red sun. Of course, sympathy and charity flow and a school, hall, a school hall is turned into a makeshift camp for the displaced. People who have never met sleep side by side on donated mattresses, and many ask why it took a catastrophe of this magnitude to finally bring forth compassion in Australians. Thank you. Little kids in the villages, kind of funny how the past becomes you. By taut cables webbing heaven bound, my body a glory of black steel. Of the past to the black on the vinyl, felt it from the day of my arrival. Sojourn near the end. For this voyage, my new master purchased a second life.
trading and floating, boats full of spices. Now I pack trunks with a crate full of flavor, some vocals.